Good morning, everyone. It's good to see the early bird crowd for what will be an ahead of the curve day. Uh, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Pearson Institute, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to a conference on, as my colleague Joe Gagnon puts it, the elephant hiding in the room. Um, in this room, the elephant's never been hiding. Uh, for a long time, under Joe, and particularly under Fred Bergston, the Institute has been very concerned about the use and abuse of currency interventions. Um, and we have been talking for many years about the right way to proceed. Uh, the rise of China with its peg, the large-scale interventions undertaken during the worst of the global financial crisis, when there was a shrinking pie. These all were things that motivated us to think that the exchange rate opportunism, for want of a better word, uh, was a real danger to not only well-being of people in certain countries, including the US, but to the system as a whole. At the same time, it's important to note some alternative concerns or some offsetting concerns, and some of which were voted by staff members of the Peterson Institute, other than Fred, uh, repeatedly. That uh, trying to build up in practical terms responses to what's called currency manipulation, at least unilaterally, could be very dangerous. Uh, that there's a reason why the IMF, despite its best intentions, from Keynes onward has never successfully sanctioned surplus countries, and there may be an inherent limit to what can be done in that regard. That perhaps the exchange rate is not as important as some people make it out to be, that real wage developments, monetary policies, and so on, are the really the dog, and the exchange rate is just the tail. And perhaps most of all, who is the judge? What is the right criterion? What is the right setting of principles, of practice, of measures that allows one to adjudicate, because that is in the end what one is doing, who is behaving badly, which countries are meriting a response? I think to repeat one point earlier, the lack of adjustment on the part of surplus countries during the global financial crisis, or during what we should at least call the North Atlantic financial crisis, uh, has given new pressure to this issue. At the same time, there are those who will say that monetary ease in some of the major economies, in particular the US, is putting pressure on currency markets from a different direction, and maybe a different form of currency intervention. I personally don't agree with that, but I do personally understand the distress of what I call the mid-majors, the smaller open economies ranging from Canada to Brazil to Switzerland that are dealing with large capital flow inflows. So this is an, a very thorny set of issues. It's one that we're proud the Peterson Institute has been at the forefront of dis debating and in particular the Joe Gagnon and Fred Bergston have been leading a provocative charge. But we are here today to really hash it out. What does this mean in terms of impact on trade and markets where we'll be starting with our first panel as well as what is practically to be done in legal terms in our second panel. Are there relationships with the WTO, for example, and the IMF that can be put into international law. And then with our third luncheon panel, we have some superb high-level speakers to achieve what was my own personal goal of today's conference, to get the non-US points of view spoken here in Washington. Not because the US point of view is wrong, but because I think, with credit to Under Secretary Brainerd, the US point of view is embodied at least in present at the G20 agreement on non-intervention. And so the question is, is that good enough? Is that sustainable? Where else should we be going? So just to start off, 
those are some of the themes I'm hoping we will cover today, and I know with our excellent, excellent speakers and program, we will do so. I just want to thank, in particular, a couple people. Um, I want to thank our colleague, oh God, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong. Lucio, please tell me the right way to say your name. Thank you. From American University Law School, who has came to Fred, Lucio de Lima Campos, who came to Fred and Joe some months ago, and it's been my privilege to pick up the baton and, and make this event happen. Um, I also, in particular, want to thank our colleague, Joseph Gagnon, who's not only been doing real intellectual spade work, but reached out to many of you to make this conference happen. And we're grateful to various supporters who, have, who allow us to say and explore things that are not necessarily PC. Um, without any further comments, since we're running a whole five minutes late, I believe, no, no only one minute late, I'm going to call Fred Bergsten to introduce the first panel. Thank you. Adam, thank you for teeing things up and for hosting and organizing the conference. Uh, thanks too to Joe. I add to Adam's thanks to him for doing the, the heavy lifting on this. I'll get the minute back by being very short in introducing this first panel. Um, as Adam said, the idea of the first panel is to outline the economics of the issue. Uh, Joe Gagnon has done some very important new research on the topic. He's been in intense discussion with his colleagues at the IMF, former colleagues at the Fed, and we hope to get that whole set of views on the table today about the importance of this currency intervention <coughs> topic and its economic effects. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of co-authoring with Joe on this topic, uh, a piece back in December just before I left for a bit of a, a sabbatical, and I think there are three really central issues that I'm going to challenge Joe to convince us on and challenge his discussants to address. One, this issue is really big. It's got very big trade impact, running into the hundreds of billions of dollars per year with big effects on trade balances, output in different countries, job creation, and the distribution thereof among different sets of countries. Two, the issue is widespread. It is not just China. It is a lot of countries that are involved and therefore has to be viewed in a broader systemic context rather than just vis-a-vis -vis China or certainly US-China bilateral. And third, crucial analytical point, Joe argues that causality runs from the buildup of reserves and intervention by surplus countries to the current account surpluses that they run, promoting their output and employment, rather than the other way around, which has tended to be more the conventional wisdom. I don't want to scoop Joe in any way. I'm sure I don't. It seems to me those are three big ones. I hope we can focus our discussion on them. I will start by introducing Joe to talk about the elephant hiding in the room and bring it out into the room. Then I will introduce Vera Thorstensen from the Hitulio Vargas Foundation in Rio, who has done an enormous amount of work on this topic in Brazil. I want to particularly, as, as uh, Adam did with Aloisio, the way I pronounce it, but either way, I suppose, uh, I want to particularly thank our Brazilian friends who not only took the initiative for this conference, but have taken the initiative internationally. They've taken the issue to the WTO. They've tried to get it on the international agenda. They have been courageous in trying to raise a very delicate, very sensitive issue in some highly politicized quarters around the world. Hats off to them. We're delighted to work with them here on that. So those are the two papers, Joe and Vera. Then we will have Louis Catau from the Fund, Doug Irwin from Dartmouth, the definitive historian of this issue from the 1930s, and Alberto Musalem from Tudor to bring a private sector uh, uh, perspective to the whole discussion. So with no further ado, Joe, lead us off, then we'll turn to Vera, then we'll have the group come forward for the discussion and open it to the audience for the first portion of today's program. Joe.
thanks uh, Adam and thanks Fred for those uh, wonderful introductions. And uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming so early in the morning. It's uh, uh, nice to see a full room here at 8.30. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, try to shine a spotlight uh, and address at least the first two of Fred's three uh, points, uh, and the third might come in later in the day, uh, but on um, the connection between currency intervention and trade imbalances. Uh, I don't want to argue that uh, this is the entire story of trade imbalances. Of course, there are other factors at work too. Uh, but in my research over the past two years on this, what has really shocked me, surprised me, I didn't expect to find this, is how tight the connection is uh, there. It's quite tight and big, as, as Fred said. It's, it's a very uh, big story, bigger than I would have expected. And one thing that I've come to take from this, which I plan to develop further in the future, is it really calls into question, in my mind, how efficient are financial markets? Are financial markets really doing what we economists think they should be doing? Uh, and, I'm, and increasingly, I'm saying not as much as I, I thought. Um, okay, so uh, let's see if I can get this to go. Okay, so uh, sometimes I call this the elephant, if, I don't know if you could see it or no, but what I have here is, is aggregate data for uh, the top 10% of reserve holders. It's, it's actually, uh, you take all countries and group their foreign exchange reserves and other government held foreign assets as a share of GDP uh, and rank them, uh, the top 10%. Uh, this is it. It's by no means uh, all the story. It does not include the second biggest reserve holder in the world, Japan. It does not include some important uh, sovereign wealth fund countries in the, in the Gulf which don't report their data. So it's not the whole problem by any means, but it's a big part of it. Uh, the, well, for these countries, uh, the solid line is their current account balance, which is the broadest measure of their trade balance. And the dashed line is uh, their net official flows which again is the broad definition of their uh, currency intervention, it includes all assets the governments buy uh, abroad. These lines are just amazingly close together. I think it's clearly not a coincidence. Uh, and they're very large. Uh, these are hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. Uh, now one question is, you know, China uh, is important and people have focused a lot on China. Uh, but even if you take uh, China out, uh, it's still pretty big. Uh, at the peak uh, in 2007, 2008, China was about half of these 10%. Uh, and uh, now, however, we, we don't have complete data for the last two years, but based on incomplete data, if I was to draw these lines out, uh, the, uh, the ones with China would be falling, but the ones without China would be flat. Uh, basically, only China is changing in this regard and other countries are not. Uh, again, uh, there's a pretty strong uh, a connection. So what's going on? Uh, I would say that uh, in some cases, uh, countries did decide that they wanted to, to buy foreign assets uh, for various reasons and that this drove the current account. But that in other cases, uh, what happened was the opposite, that the current account sort of drove the asset purchases in that case, countries have saw export booms, and that put upward pressure on their currencies, and to resist that upward pressure, they bought foreign exchange. And so the causality can go in either direction, and it, it, it does for different countries. Uh, but the point is that there could have been alternative policies. If, if they either had chosen to let the exchange rate go, or if they had chosen to keep their exchange rate but, but through monetary policy instead of currency intervention, I believe a different outcome uh, would have happened. Anyway, the bottom line is that at least for some countries, it's a subsample of the world, not all countries, really uh, currency intervention is the current account imbalance. Now let me just go quickly to a little background. Uh, as you know, current account or trade balances are the difference between <coughs> exports and imports. 
which are in turn determined by prices, spending, uh, productive capacity, and trade barriers at home and abroad, as well as the exchange rate. Uh, but prices, spending, the exchange rate, and some parts of productive capacity are themselves affected by exports, so there's a complicated interrelationship here to causality. Uh, this is an area I've worked on uh, long in my professional life uh, before, before this. Uh, in the United States, we have a relatively stable economic structure and a lot of data, so we can make some progress in this complicated area. But when we want to go and look at imbalances around the world, uh, we have to deal with the fact that other countries uh, have much more important economic structural changes that make it hard to analyze the data. They've got uh, much shorter amounts of data available. And then prices, the way prices are measured internationally, uh, is hard to compare across countries. So it's really hard to make progress in this traditional uh, structural way. So about uh, 10 years ago, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, Manzi Chin and Eswar Prasad started a different agenda for looking at cross-country imbalances. Uh, and they noted that the current account balance also is the difference between a country's saving and investment. And so they thought, sought to explain the current account balances by underlying relatively exogenous factors that drive saving, investment, and trade. <coughs> and uh, some of these are demographics, fiscal policy, uh, wealth, stage development. Uh, and so this launched a series of papers uh, that I thought was uh, quite successful. Well, my contribution uh, was to add one more relatively exogenous factor, I hoped, which was government exchange rate policy. Th these papers didn't look at what governments were doing specifically to affect their exchange rate, which of course would have something to do with their current account balance. It seemed to me an obvious omission from the literature. So uh, one, the, the, I thought the best way to measure it would be, look, let's just look at what governments are spending. Uh, and if we're going to have current account balances are in dollars, you have a measure of what governments are doing to affect their exchange rate in dollars, or, or whatever currency you want to use. Uh, and you can, you can relate those. Um, and uh, what I'm looking at is what I call net official flows, NOF, which is total government investment in foreign assets minus government borrowing in foreign markets. And, but accumulation of foreign exchange reserves, which is the most uh, commonly mentioned one, is the most important element of this, but it's not the, the only one. So uh, what is this connection? Well, for 40 of the most important advanced and emerging markets, uh, you can see uh, in this chart, uh, each country is denoted by a little two-letter symbol. We have um, uh, what we're showing here is averages uh, of current account balances and net official flows over the past 25 years. So for each country, it's their average current account and their average net official flow over a long period of time. The vertical axis is the current account. The horizontal axis is the official flows. Uh, the, the positive relationship is clear, but it's really uh, dominated by this one country in the upper right, that's SG is for Singapore. If you zoom in to just the other 39 countries, however, you still see a positive relationship. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, so, you know, it bears further scrutiny. Um, one question would be, this is obviously true, or it seems to have some, some reality across countries, uh, but what about within countries? Uh, within countries, is there a connection? Uh, well, uh, what we have for a number of countries, there's actually quite a strong connection. You can see that both the level of the current account, the solid line, and the level of intervention, the dashed line, are very close to each other and move very closely with each other over time. Uh, and so here we have Egypt, Korea, Norway, Pakistan, a very uh, diverse group of countries. And there are others uh, for which this works. You can look in the paper. Uh, but there are other countries uh, where it's not quite so close. So Brazil and India are two important countries. You can see some correlation in Brazil and India, but it's not as tight as for those first four. Uh, and then there's other countries, such as South Africa and Sweden, where there really is, is very little correlation. So I guess uh, what we need to do is a bit more careful statistics to try to really disentangle as many factors that work here many factors that could be explaining current accounts, and we need to disentangle just the ones uh, that we're concerned about. So uh, for those of you who don't like uh, equations, uh, these are the only equations that I'll be showing in the whole presentation, uh, so bear with me. Uh, 
A trade deficit has to be financed. It requires borrowing from abroad, or if you have a trade surplus, what that means is that you're lending abroad. So the first equation shows that the uh, current account balance must equal uh, either the, the flows of borrowing or lending, which must come either from the government or from the private sector. So the, the first uh, flow of, of borrowing or lending is net official flows, and the second one is net private flows, NPF. And then there is a residual because um, we don't measure things perfectly. But in fact, uh, it turns out that the, the residual, the error there, is, is fairly small. Um, and the paper talks about that. OK. The key, question, the key equation of the paper is the next equation. Uh, what we're looking at is, do net private flows respond to official flows? Do, do, does the financial market offset what governments do? And this is the key question that we'll be coming back to again and again. The uh, efficient markets theory says that that lambda there in the second equation uh, should be minus one. So that when the government takes capital and sends it somewhere else, uh, the financial market will undo that. Why is that? Well, we think of efficient markets as equating rates of return across countries. There should be equal. And if you send capital from one country to another country, you will raise the return on capital where you, in the country where you took it from, and you will lower it in the country where you sent it from. And if governments do this, that will disequilibrate markets, and markets will reestablish equilibrium by sending capital back in the other way. And so uh, this is why we believe, this is why economists believe that sterilized intervention doesn't have much effect, because markets undo uh, what governments do. OK, uh, that's the efficient markets view. Uh, if, if markets are not efficient, lambda will be greater than minus 1. It might even be 0. If it's 0, markets really aren't doing anything uh, here. OK, the other element of this equation is the C times x. x is a vector. Think of x as a bunch of variables, uh, the exogenous variables I mentioned, demographics, fiscal policy, et cetera. OK, and then um, the third equation here is just really the sum of the first two. It just says that you can run this regression. You can look at private flows and regress them on net official flows. Or you can look at the current account and you can regress them on net official flows. The coefficient will be different. If you regress the current account, you get 1 plus lambda. In that case, if lambda is minus 1, then 1 plus lambda is 0. So that means that official flows have no effect on the current account when markets are efficient because they're all offset by private flows. So the problem with just going out and running these regressions is that, and I have done it, uh, but uh, it's only uh, valid to do that if net official flows are exogenous to the private flows and to the current. In other words, if, if governments have their own agenda for reserves that doesn't bear any relation to the exchange rate or to trade flows or capital flows, then you can run this regression. But the problem is that that's not true. Uh, and so let's look at the case of, of Japan. Okay, so if you look at Japan, what I show here is the solid line is the net private flows, NPF, that you just saw, and the dashed line is the net official flows or the currency intervention. So if you look at Japan, it looks like whenever private flows go up, intervention goes down. Whenever intervention goes up, private flows <coughs> go down. Very strong negative correlation. So what's going on here? Well, there's two interpretations for Japan. <coughs> One interpretation is that Japanese financial markets are highly efficient. <coughs> and whenever the Japanese government tries to muck about in the foreign exchange market, the private sector just says, ah, we see through that. We're going to undo it. And so their intervention has no effect. And that's the efficient markets result, and they get a lambda of minus 1. Well, that's one interpretation. A different interpretation is that Japanese financial markets are not efficient that the proverbial Japanese uh, investor, Mrs. Watanabe, uh, has alternating waves of euphoria and fear in which she either sends money abroad and weakens the yen, or gets panicked and brings it all back and pushes the yen up. And that drives the sharp movements in the blue line. The Japanese government, seeing these waves of euphoria and panic, says, well, when people are flooding back into Japan, that pushes the yen up. We don't like that. It's going to hurt our exports. So we're going to try to offset it. And that explains the dashed line moving up. That's the other interpretation. I actually think the other interpretation 
fits better with uh, reporting of, of this issue, but obviously you can have your own opinion. I would note that uh, if, if the government were driving things, then you would expect to see at least a little bit of yen weakness whenever the red dash line goes up. But what you're actually seeing is the yen is strong when the red dash line goes up. So that implies that it really is the government responding to the private sector more than vice versa. But of course it could be some of both. So I uh, can't rule that out. But as long as the Japanese government cares about the exchange rate, uh, there's going to be some endogeneity. And that says our regression it complicates our life uh, for our regression. Uh, I would note, by the way, in passing, that the red dash line is above zero every year since 1990. Uh, it never goes below zero for a whole year. Um, and what that tells you is that uh, really the go Japanese government is on balance trying to perpetuate a current account surplus. Uh, if they didn't have that desire, then their intervention would be more symmetric around zero. They could respond to the exchange rate still, but they should be responding in a more symmetric way around zero. Okay, so to solve this problem, we need instrumental variables. And that's sort of the whole point of the, the working paper I put out. Um, we need to come up with something that captures the reason for the government to buy foreign assets that is independent of stabilizing the exchange rate in the face of these shocks. And so I, I have three main instruments in the paper. I've used different combinations of it. It's not, the results aren't too sensitive to this, but uh, certainly there's more things that could be done and discussed. I don't have time to go into it too much. Uh, one instrument is if you take the stock, the lag stock of assets that you have uh, relative to some measure of reserve adequacy, so either months of imports or your short-term foreign debt or your GDP, uh, this could be some, get some metric for, are you sh do you have enough reserves, too much or too little, that could be relatively slow moving and, and exogenous with respect to these high frequency financial shocks. Another one would be if you set up a sovereign wealth fund for your natural resource exports, where you have, a, as a country, decided to save abroad, and that's, uh, for those specific countries, you can put that in. Uh, and then, uh, if you have a her history of a recent currency crisis in the past, uh, uh, five or ten years, uh, basically I have a measure of if you've been repaying the IMF and IMF loan in the recent past, uh, you might be more sensitive to wanting to build reserves and that might be a reason to build reserves sort of independent of other, other factors. So these are three instruments that we've tr uh, tried to use. Okay. So the regression analysis proceeds. Uh, I use the same baseline sample that the IMF did last year in its uh, study of, of imbalances. It's 40 countries uh, over the past 25 years. I split the 25 years up into five year periods, um, basically, again, to sort of get, not have to worry about modeling dynamics in the data and look at more medium to long run factors, but I've done it with annual data. I've done it with a much larger sample of 115 countries. We have different instruments. We can look at different X variables. I'm gonna not have time to go into all the permutations. Um, Basically, what I'm doing is I'm going to run a regression of both these equations at the bottom uh, that are uh, net private flows regressed on all these variables and current account regressed on all these variables. And I'm going to talk about that lambda, lambda that you see in there. Uh, ideally, they should be the same in both equations, uh, but they don't have to be, so that's some, something we can look at. One difference is you notice I put a little hat, a little hat on the NOF. That's because now I'm using the value of official flows that was predicted by those instruments. It's sort of stripped of some of the endogeneity problem that I talked about earlier. Again, statistical, don't want to get into that too much, but uh, that for those uh, of you who care, that's what we're doing. Okay, the baseline results. Uh, it turns out that the estimate of lambda, which is in the top row, uh, is minus 0 0.21, uh, and it's from both the net private uh, flows as well as the current account regression, which doesn't have to be, it isn't, it isn't you know, always that way, but uh, that's a nice feature. That implies that uh, financial markets offset about 21 cents out of every dollar country spent on intervention. So if uh, Japan spends a dollar buying US assets, private markets take 21 cents of that and send it back to Japan. Uh, that means that Japan's current account balance of necessity goes up by 79 cents of that dollar. Uh, so that's a very big effect, much bigger uh, than I would have expected. 
If you don't use instruments, you get a coefficient of minus 0.5, which has a financial markets offset about half, and that means that current accounts move by about the other half, 0.5. Uh, but if you do use instruments, you get a bigger effect. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, the other coefficients in this regression all have the right signs or plausible values. I'll quickly just note what these variables are. These are the x variables that you saw in the earlier equation. The fiscal policy, I've I've got a, a fiscal policy that's cyclically adjusted to sort of remove the endogenous part of fiscal policy uh, that has a positive effect but not big on the current account balance. NPFA is net private foreign assets, so what the private sector holds on net uh, in the rest of the world, and that has a slightly positive effect because of earnings on those assets. YPPP is the per capita. PPP per GDP per capita relative to the U.S. So if you get to be a richer country relative to the U.S., you tend to have a current account surplus. Uh, Y4 is the forecast of growth over the next five years from the IMF's forecast, historical forecast. That has a big effect. If you're a fast-growing country, you tend to have a current account deficit. And then a very interesting the coefficient is the health coefficient. The IMF picked this up last year, and, and I've been finding it to be a very robust. Countries, every dollar countries spend on health expenditures has almost a dollar, about 90 cents or so, of negative effect on their current account. That's truly amazing, but it seems to be quite a robust result. Uh, and that says that the, all this advice about China to build out its social safety nets as a way to reduce its current account surplus really is right. I mean, it really is working. I'm, I'm not surprised at how big that is, but it really seems to be a solid result. Uh, very interesting. Uh, energy, small positive effect, uh, not huge, but as you might expect. Uh, aging, if your population is expected to age over the next 20 years, you will save a lot. You'll be saving for retirement. In that case, you have a big positive effect on your current account balance because you're saving. That makes sense. Finally, capital controls. This number for capital controls, the last variable, is a pretty big number. Capital controls range from zero for the open countries like the US to 100 for the very closed economies. I'm not sure which is the most closed economy. China was about an 87 or 88 until recently, and it's now more like um, 70, I think. Uh, but what this says is for an open country, there's no effect. But for a closed economy, fully closed cap to capital inflows, uh, they have uh, surpluses of 3 to 4 percentage points from that reason. OK. Um, And I, I don't have time to go through the other regressions that I've mentioned, but the range of lambdas typically, the central tendency is about minus 0.4 to 0, which implies a current account effect of 60 cents to a dollar for every dollar in intervention. You can actually get a bigger range, and I think probably Luis from the IMF will talk about that more, and then we can discuss that later. But I find that uh, the reasons, I find reasons for that that I tend to not, to, to not like those estimates, and most of them do tend to cluster in this range. Uh, okay, so maybe let me finish, but on uh, pictures, because perhaps some of you don't like these dry statistics, just numbers, after all, what does that mean? So I think what I find convincing sometimes is what, you really, what we really want here is a what if. We know that uh, a number of countries had big increases in their current account surpluses in the past decade, and we know that they piled up a hell of a lot of reserves, okay? Uh, but what if they didn't? What, what if when their current accounts went up, they didn't make that decision? They didn't decide to pile up a lot of reserves. Would it have made any difference? I often hear, oh, they still would have had current account surpluses. It doesn't matter. They chose to buy those reserves because they had a surplus, but it was a matter of convenience. And if they didn't buy those reserves, they would still have had a surplus. It wouldn't make no difference. So, uh, so let's look at a case, a case study. Let's say two countries in Asia that had roughly similar circumstances, more or less. And I'll start with Singapore. Singapore, uh, going in uh, from 2001 to 2003, Singapore, what I have here, by the way, is uh, the blue bars are the current account balance of Singapore. The, the pink bars are the uh, net official flow. It's a currency intervention. And they're both shown on the left scale as a percent of GDP. The line here is the real exchange rate between Singapore and the United States. Okay. And so what was going on from 2001 to 2003 is that Singapore was stabilizing very tightly its nominal 
exchange rate with the dollar, but Singapore was undergoing massive deflation. And because of Singapore's deflation, its real exchange rate was falling as it was pegging its nominal exchange rate. And that's what happened there. In 2003, Singapore was hit by a big explosion of exports. The blue bars jumped up. And to hang on to that exchange rate peg, they massively increased their intervention. That's the pink bar jumped way up. Okay. So uh, that was Singapore's initial response. Then in 2004, 2005, Singapore gradually let go, the, the, let their currency appreciate against the dollar, and some of that real appreciation was recovered, but not all of it, in fact, and they really held on tightly throughout the next four years. Okay. So um, it's interesting to note that if you look at the first two years on average, and then the next four years on average, and compare the change of the current account from the first two years to the second four years, to the change in the net official flows from the first two years to the second four years, that relationship is almost exactly the coefficient I just showed you from the regressions, 0.8. Basically, their current account rose in the second four years by 80% of the increase in their intervention in the second four years, 80%. So it also holds up the regression results. Okay, so this is, this is what Singapore did, and this is what happened in Singapore. This is a common story. We had big increase in current account surpluses. Countries chose to res restrain uh, appreciation, and they got <coughs> large increases in reserves. Let's look at a different country in the same region, Korea. Korea uh, didn't have as much uh, current account surplus as Singapore to start with. It's true. I've, I've left the scales the same so you can see how to compare Singapore and Korea. Korea didn't have as big a current account surplus. It doesn't have the high saving rate of, of Singapore. So it didn't start quite in the same place. Uh, but in 2003, Korea was hit with the same, roughly, shock to its exports. Uh, exports start to rise. However, in Korea's case, uh, Korea did not try to hold on to its exchange rate. You notice in, in Singapore, the exchange rate was going down into 2003. In Korea, it's going up. So already, uh, Korea uh, has allowed its currency to rise by 2003, which is probably why its current account didn't go up as much as Singapore's. It probably was hit by a similar demand shock, but it, it allowed more equilibration. So it still had some increase in the current account, the blue bar, in 2003, but not as much because it was already letting the exchange rate go. But it was not completely letting the exchange rate go. As you can <coughs> see, the pink bar goes up in 2003 and 2004 by quite a bit. They did resist this appreciation somewhat. Nevertheless, not so they resisted it, but they didn't resist it completely. Uh, current account goes up, intervention goes up. Then in 2005, Korea had a change. There was political debate in Korea. Why are we buying all these foreign exchange reserves? You know, does it make sense? Uh, and they decided to stop. They said, we're not going to do this. So pink bars go down. Note that, of course, this lets the exchange rate appreciate even sharper. They let the exchange rate go goes up, current account goes back down towards zero. Uh, they chose a different path. They got a different outcome. This, I believe, to me is quite convincing that if countries do choose different policies, they will get different results. And to me, this is the real proof of the pudding that this does matter. It's not just a correlation that's a coincidence. It's actually uh, a policy that matters. And I would note that if you, again, in Korea, look at from the first two years to the second two years, the ratio of the rise in the current account to the rise in net official flows, it's almost exactly, actually, it's a little bit higher than what my regressions would imply. And then if you look at the fall from the middle two years to the last two years, again, those relations are exactly what the regression would imply. And Korea and Singapore, by global standards, have very open capital markets, well-developed capital markets, presumably efficient capital markets, and this still happens. I find it amazing. So, in conclusion, uh, currency intervention matters. Uh, my best guess is that about each dollar of intervention raises the current account about 80 cents. That's far higher than anyone thought, including myself, just a year ago. Uh, I would have never predicted this. Uh, it, it, I have looked at whether capital controls change that coefficient, and maybe a little bit, but uh, it's really hard to be sure. 
Uh, and as I just showed you, for some countries that are on global standards are pretty open capital markets, there's big effects. This says that even in countries that don't have capital controls, financial markets really aren't that efficient. Financial markets really aren't doing a very good job. Uh, they are responding to fads, perhaps, and whims that we don't understand very well, but they don't seem to be related strongly to equating rates of return smoothly across markets. Uh, I think uh, one thing that's not on this slide is that I think the biggest impact is clearly on the United States because the U.S. is the leading reserve currency, but uh, uh, current countries are, are diversifying their reserves, so many countries are, are being affected now, and even countries that aren't reserve currencies uh, are being affected uh, to some extent because capital markets aren't, do, have, do spill over somewhat. So it, it's a big imp impact. Um, as Fred mentioned earlier, if you have total up the amount spent on intervention around the world, it's well over a trillion dollars a year, it's still going on even last year, another trillion dollars, uh, even after the peak was maybe a trillion and a half. That's a big number in anyone's book. Uh, and I think, uh, given that this is a macro uh, phenomenon, it seems to me the best answers would be, the best policy responses would be in the macro space, but I think I'll leave that um, for a uh, later discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's go directly to the, the history of this research. I spent, uh, I can tell you, 30 years of my life in uh, dealing with trade issues. I spent 15 or more in Geneva. And then in 2010, I decided to go back to Brazil and start a, a center on international trade. And I met, I have the luck to meet Professor Emerson Massau, it's here with me, and Professor Lucas Ferraz, and we start dealing with exchange rate and trade. Why? Because I spent so many years in Geneva, and every time I just raised the issue, exchange rates, I read instructions. Don't talk about the exchange rate here, here, because exchange rate is an issue of IMF, it's not an issue of WTO, etc. Okay, so um, because, because I'm not in the, working in the, the government anymore, I decided to study and to see what's the impact of exchange rate on trade and, and on trade rules. So. Here is a thing that everybody knows, the Big Mac. Here you can see that you have overvalued country and the valued country, undervalued country. This is a real serious result. This is the IMF, the result of the pilot external sector report. Mr. Catão is here. And here is a serious work on measuring the misalignment of exchange rates. As you can see, there you have bands here, and you can see that you have a lot of countries with undervalued uh, currency on your left, and uh, here countries with overvalued on your right. Here is a marvelous work of uh, Professor Klein and Williamson. I put a graphic on it. I hope they like the green color. That is, you have again, there's a different methodology. Uh, the IMF is using uh, the looking for the exchange rate that, um, that uh, gives an equilibrium of the current account. Here is a, a, a different methodology looking for a target equilibrium. And here you have the result of our work in Brazil that is trying to see, um, is another methodology, not using the current account, but using the net foreign asset uh, methodology. There's a lot of econometrics behind this. Professor Lucas is here to explain to you and uh, is, we use covariance matrices and all this uh, very, very sophisticated methodology and see the, the, the efficacy of this. But just to give you a uh, good idea that here you have overvalued and Brazil is there, United Kingdom is there, Singapore, Turkey, and you have um, uh, the, the other undervalued countries. Uh, here I put together, this, this is the same, just we use three methodologies, this is the average of, the, uh, of them. The, the main point is you have countries with overvalued currencies and you have countries with undervalued currencies. 
Then I compare the three, the three methodology, and what you get, different results. And this is a challenge for you economists. Can you help us to have just one methodology saying that a country is overvalued or not? Because if not, you are not going to move further. Uh, here you can see that Brazil and China, for some of these, you have the same results. And all the three methodologies are pointing to the same direction. Great. Why I need this? This is to explain more our uh, methodology. As you can see, Brazil is overvalued. 20% now, after the shock of last six months ago, we moved to 15%, but Brazil is still overvalued. Here is the US, come on. Uh, a little bit different result from the IMF. For me, Brazil is undervalued 5%. This is for China, a long period of undervaluation, right? Here is the, the Europe, is, uh, Europe zone. You have inside countries overvalued, other countries devalued, and so you have the poor pigs all overvalued. They cannot change their trade rates, so they have to cut wages. It's a terrible thing. Uh, the question is, OK, you know about this. What you can do? And I, we decide to do what I spend all my life doing, tarifying exchange rate misalignment. So what I did? I use a formula, it's not a sophisticated one, forget about the formula. What I did is to, I apply, I tarify the, the exchange rate misalignment. Because come on, you have to pay, to, to pay it at the border. So you have the tariff in the WTO tariff, and you have the misalignment, overvalue, undervalue. And the, the point is, the, you have the consequences here. Look for the green line only. This is an example of China. Here, the circle is the bound tariff of China. The green is applied tariff of China. And you have here on the horizontal line the whole spectrum of industrialized goods. We started 0, 01, it's animal life, 0, 02, animal death, meat, 0, 03, preparation of meat. And you have all uh, textiles and all machinery, all electronics, still in 97. And I, 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 we are doing this for two digits, four digits, six and 80 digits. So we are really working hard on this. These are averages. What do you have? The green line is the real thing for, for WTO. The, the, the blue line is when you apply, you tarify your exchange rate. So what is the consequences of misalignment? You completely change the tariff you bound at the WTO. And further than this, because the bound rate, the circles, are so near the green line, you have no space to move. So in this example, with this calculation, the misalignment of China for us is 17% negative. Brazil is overvalued 20, China is negative uh, minus 17. So what's this year? So what's the consequence? Not only China is giving subsidies to its exports, more than this, China is violating Article 2. What's the Article 2 of GATT? That countries cannot have different tariffs more uh, bigger than the, 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 the bound one. Here you have the consequences. When you try to put together the valuation of China and Brazil, China and Germany, China and US, and for us, uh, United, United States is minus five, uh, undervalued. Here you have the results. The green light is the, 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 the thing that China presents in WTO. And you can see for the, all the other countries that when facing China, they have a, a, a tariff that's bigger than the real one they have in the WTO. Here you have the example of the United States. Again, uh, the bound rates, the circles, the applied rate, the, 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 the green line, if you apply the minus 5%, you have a tariff that's bigger than the tariff you consolidate in the WTO. Uh, uh, and I love this graphic. Here, you, if you combine China, US, and China, uh, United States, and Spain, United States, and uh, uh, Brazil, you have completely different tariffs. Come on, you are destroying, with exchange rate misalignment, you are destroying Article 1 the most favored nation article, the most important article, principle of WTO, that you are not applying different tariff for each country. So come on, misalignment is destroying Article 1, Article 2 of WTO, the basis of WTO. Now I have for Brazil, poor Brazil. It's a completely different example. It's overvalued. You know what's the consequence of it? Again, the 
uh, bound rate the blue, applied rate the green, look the, the, the red and the yellow, the applied rate is the yellow. Brazil is completely without protection at the border. Don't say that Brazil is protectionist. Well, this is just a result that it, the overvaluation of Brazil is completely destroying a right that Brazil has to protect its tariff, uh, the country, its goods with tariff. It's completely destroyed, right? Here I have a, a, a lot of examples. Look the European Union, and this I use the euro, right? Here you have the green light, the applied rates, the circles, the bound rate. You can see that different countries is sporting toward the, the, the community using completely different tariff. So again, Article 1 and 2 completely destroy it. So the conclusions, countries with overvalued exchange rates like Brazil have their negotiated tariff reduced and nullified. Countries with undervalued exchange rates, US and China example, grant subsidies to their export and uh, their applied tariff surpass the bound levels agreed in WTO. The point is that it's not only tariff that, that, that are being uh, undermined. I'm working with uh, anti dumping subsidies. Do you know the result in Brazil? The change rate is, the effect of a change rate is five times bigger than the dumping we impose on the, on the, the product. So what you are doing is that to show you that exchange rate is destroying tariff, anti-dumping, anti-subsidy, and uh, uh, rules of origin based on value, and even the, uh, the DSP retaliation. So the point is that WHO does not have adequate rules to address the issue. So what is the proposal? You can go to the IMF discussion and talk about manipulation. That is, is a very t terrible word uh, that it is Article 4. And in the WHO, we have another instrument, and another concept. That's the concept of frustration. Frustration, what? The objectives of the, 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 the GATT agreement. Here you have the, the law. The frustration is here. Forget about this. This is for lawyers. I love lawyers in this way. So, and here you have a good example. In the 90s, 19, in 1980, after the Tokyo round, there is an uh, exchange rate group, a working group on exchange rate in WHO, and they approved a decision that is to allow countries, under the valid countries, after the explosion of the, the Bretton Woods uh, system, to uh, renegotiate the tariff. So you have a, jurisdic a jurisprudence in the WHO, the old GATT in the 80s, say that a country can renegotiate tariff if they, they have, uh, um, in this case, depreciated currency against a specific tariff. So we have an example. So I try to, to work with this, a lot of economics, a lot of uh, 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 studies in law, to see what will be a kind of answer to this. What is our challenge here is to discover, first, how to measure misalignment. Can economists agree? It is the IMF methodology better. It is the net foreign asset. It is the current account. It doesn't matter. The question is we need to go and discover one methodology that best, best measure the effects on trade. This is the challenge for us. What is the best methodology that measure the effects on trade? If we have this, how we can solve it? And here is my masterpiece, the masterpiece <laughs> of my group. Here you have, I decided that, come on, manipulation is a very complicated thing. Forget about manipulation. This is a thing for IMF, for the economists. In the WTO language, what I learned in Geneva is that you have to try to get consensus. And uh, all the countries first, all the countries have the right to, flo to float its currency, right? They have, to, to, they have the right to float its currency. The question is how much that can float. That's the point. What I did here, we construct a currency of the world based in 25 countries, because 85% of the currency. And then we try to measure the, the, the misalignment of each country toward this basket of the trade currency, right? And I call, you know, the, 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 the unit can be uh, Lamis, in honor of Mr. Lamis, that is the, the, the Director General of WHO. Then we put this, you, uh, you normalize this in standard deviation. 
Uh, you can think about minus 10%, minus 20 <coughs> to have a, a, a reference. You can see that inside the band of 10%, minus 1 and plus 1, you have a lot of crunches going up and down. The, uh, with the band of minus 20, can be 20%, you have only few of them getting out. So our proposal is let every country fluctuate, but to a limit. After it, it if, if the, the misalign is persistent and substantial, you are destroying the WTO rules. Let us go to the WTO and negotiate a way to neutralize the effect. So the point is, if you are doing misalignment which persistently over more than six months, more than one year, come on, you are destroying the whole building, the whole structure of WTO. The point here is the concept of time. Uh, how long a country can violate a WTO rule? to get a panel uh, being organized against it and a rule on this. In, in, in economies, we have a big seminar in Geneva, and the, they spoke on the language IMF, no conclusions. The point is, at the long run, everybody agrees that countries will reach to equilibrium. The point is, the concept of time in economics is different from the concept of time in law, in, the, in international law. So for how long you have to, 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 to be uh, manipulating your currency, to have uh, something made against you? The point is, uh, uh, without this concept, the difference of time, of the violation of rules, you cannot uh, get, uh, uh, you are killing the efficacy of all the trade, the, trade, the trade law. Now, this is a multilateral solution. And this is the look for Brazil against bilateral uh, misalignment. And here is for the United States, uh, marvelous work that uh, Emerson is doing. Uh, you can do all this bilaterally, uh, more than the, 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 the multilateral one. So the conclusion is substantial and persistent exchange rate misalignment affect the effectiveness of trade instruments negotiated in the WTO. Therefore, they must be object to WTO regulation. Juridical concept time is different from the economic concept, as I told you. And in summary, the WTO must address the effects of exchange rate misalignment or misalignment. Exchange rate will turn the WTO into juridical and economic fiction. That is a challenge for us. That's it. Thank you very much.